Good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome back to Brewing Jitsu. You may have noticed, new angle, new look, new shot. I hope you like it. I wanted to bring you here in the office to talk about audio, specifically microphones. So come along. I promise there's good coffee content to be found in this episode, but I am going to be showing you a little bit more about the details of how I am recording audio for this channel. Roll that intro. All right, before I get started, cheers. Hope you all are well. This is still a coffee channel. What I have in here is a Peruvian coffee from Black and White Coffee Roasters. This is the Ulysses Naira anaerobic wash coffee from San Ignacio Cajamarca in Peru. Now audio might be one of the most commonly overlooked things when you're thinking about a YouTube channel. Lighting, the setting, what camera, what kind of filters, what lenses you're going to put on the front. All of those things get so much care and attention when you're curating an image. But I think that bad audio quality where it's difficult to hear somebody or the tone of what the audio is capturing isn't pleasing can really distract from an otherwise beautifully lit, composed and staged scene. Let me walk you through a little bit of what the setup here is like. This is a very small apartment style office with hard drywall and a relatively high ceiling. So it's completely untreated besides carpet on the floor. So this is a really suboptimal location to be recording. We're trying to avoid that time and expense of putting up a bunch of sound treatment in a space that we don't own. For that reason, I'm interested in how I could get the best quality audio out of a space like this. So I have five different microphones that I'm going to be comparing in this video. The microphone you've been hearing so far up until now is the DD V-Mic D3, the non-pro version. This short shotgun mic is sitting in the flash shoe of my Canon EOS R6, about three feet away from my mouth. It is suboptimal placement for a shotgun microphone. You'll find that most of the YouTubers who are really good at sound are miking themselves overhead from a boom that's just slightly out of frame. A lot of people use these camera top shotgun microphones on top of their camera. So I wanted to use that as sort of the base, the standard to which the other audio options I'm using are compared to. The next two microphones you're gonna hear are these two that you see here in frame. On this side is the SE Electronics V7 dynamic handheld style microphone. It's got a pop filter attached to it inside a shock mount, which is attached to a traditional microphone stand at a frame here. On this side is the Audio-Technica AT2020 medium diaphragm condenser microphone. So this microphone has a pop filter that's attached by elastic bands to the microphone itself, and then it's mounted directly without a shock mount onto one of those flexible boom arms that allows me to move it around. This microphone is my standard microphone for Zoom and other teleconferencing things. The reason I wanted to compare these two microphones to each other is that I've recently started to get into podcast production. I picked up these two microphones for podcasting specifically, and they're almost complete opposites from each other. The V7 is a dynamic microphone that does not require phantom power. The AT2020 is a condenser microphone that does require 48 volts of phantom power from the audio interface. The V7 is an end address style microphone. The AT2020 is a side address style microphone. In theory, the V7 dynamic microphone should be much better at rejecting some of the bounce and other sounds that you might be hearing from the room, whereas the AT2020 being a condenser microphone is thought to be more natural sounding of a microphone, although it will pick up more things such as key clicks or the fan of my computer, which is sitting on my desk over here. Now, the other two microphones I'm gonna cover today are not as obvious or front and center as these two, but they're gonna be a little bit more practical if you're thinking about audio production for video or for YouTube. The first microphone in that pair, you can see right here on my chest. This is the Saramonic 
UW Mic 9 wireless lavalier system. The lavalier has a wire that's running on the inside of my shirt down to the mic pack, which is in my pocket here, with the transmitter sitting right here on my desk recording into the audio recorder. I'll refer you to Gerald Undone's video, link in the description, which is where I first heard about this microphone. The fifth and final microphone that I'm comparing here is the AT2021 pencil condenser microphone. Now this microphone is classically an instrument microphone. In this case, I have the AT21 sitting down on my desk and it is about two feet away from my mouth. So we can see how does this sound compared to the camera top shotgun microphone or a wireless lavalier system. I think that those three microphones are probably the most common styles of microphone that may be used for video production. And I'm really interested to see which one sounds better. Now the final piece to the puzzle is the Zoom H5 audio recorder. I love this thing. I can connect it to my computer over USB and use it as a direct audio interface. It's got great clean sounding preamps and can provide phantom power to at least two inputs, which is how I'm providing the phantom power to the AT20 and the AT2021. I can run my electronic piano into or any sort of standard three and a half millimeter out. In addition to the H5 recorder itself, I did also pick up the EXH6 capsule and that's how right now I'm recording four separate channels of audio. That's the SE Electronics V7, the AT2020, the UW Mic 9, and the AT2021 pencil condenser all at the same time. Add to that the fifth channel, the Deity VMic D3, sitting on top of the camera. Final technical note. Most of the audio that I use for the YouTube channel has at least a few different effects on it. I will be using none of that for this audio sample portion. The only thing I will do is normalize all the audio to the same loudness in DaVinci Resolve. Another sip of coffee, and let's get started. Coffee is my ritual, my exogenous endorphin, the sight, sound, and smell of my morning. And I think that coffee is amazing. Perhaps about 154 million adults in the US drink coffee, or 75% of those age over 20 years old, based off of NHANES data published back in 2016. Whether that's black coffee with cream or sugar, espresso, or venti double frap mocha pumpkin spice latte, coffee is a staple of the American diet. But how does that coffee end up in our cups here in the USA? And who are the hands that are responsible for caring for the bean that powers the nation? If you're looking to find these people, you have to leave the country. Although Hawaii is one of the only places in the USA where coffee is grown, much of our comfy comes from Central, South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. And growing coffee is a hard job. Much of the best quality coffee is grown higher than 1,500 meters above sea level in relatively dry, arid climes. It's kind of like wine. Adversity in the growing produces the most nuanced, expressive coffee bean for your cup. Now, we all typically think of coffee as being a bean, but really, it's a cherry, a fruit. What we think of as the coffee bean is actually the seed or the pit of the coffee cherry. And even after the coffee's been grown painstakingly at high altitude, there's a lot of work that the farmer has to do before sending the roasters the green beans ready for production. First, once the cherries are ripe, just like fruit, they are picked. While machines can do that job, the best way to ensure you're picking the cherries at peak ripeness is to do it by hand. Once picked, the cherries need to be fermented so that the fruit comes off exposing that coffee bean. They can be washed, fermented in the open, or sealed away to undergo anaerobic fermentation. Once hulled, the green coffee beans need to be dried and carefully stored. Too wet, you risk mold and spoilage. Too dry, and you risk the coffee tasting like straw or wood when it's roasted. These green coffee beans are then loaded into containers to make the long trip, usually by boat, to the United States. Once green coffee beans arrive at the roaster, they're sorted to remove any defects, spoiled beans, or sticks or stones that might have made it into the bag. 
then they're carefully roasted to bring out the flavor. The variables here are incredible. How hot do you have the roaster before you start or charge temperature? How much cold coffee goes into the roaster? When does the coffee actually start heating up, the turn point? Or how fast does the coffee temperature rise, that rate of rise that you hear from coffee roasters? First crack, second crack, and the temperature when it's all done, and finally when the roasted coffee comes rushing out, that drop temperature. It's thanks to these talented people who are roasting, roasting, and roasting until they get the best flavor possible that we get to drink coffee like this. It's really humbling to think that farmer, processor, exporter, shipper, importer, roaster, the coffee has made it all the way from far-flung corners of the world to your cup in the morning. And that's why I love coffee so much. It is an intimately human experience, a story of transformation from an unassuming little bush to this amazing drink that is enjoyed by so many different people in the world. To all of you who are responsible for bringing coffee to each one of us, thank you. All right, thanks for listening. Let me know, what did you think? Could you tell a difference between the five microphones? Which one would you rather listen to on YouTube? Which one would you rather listen to for a podcast? In future videos, I'll be taking a deeper dive going into the camera, the lenses, the microphones, and all of the other equipment that I've started to use to produce video content. Anyhow, thanks for watching. Hit that like button, subscribe if you aren't already, and we'll see you soon. Take care.